The following video provides an overview and assessment of the Families for Finance program, a financial empowerment program developed by and for shelter guests at People Serving People, a shelter in Hennepin County. This program was developed as an alternative to the existing shelter model that required families to pay a portion of their income for emergency shelter. Our team at the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs, CURA, assessed this pilot program, and even in the face of particular challenges imposed by COVID-19, we think the FFF program yielded promising results and informed best practices that can be integrated into the next iteration of the FFF program at People Serving People. We also think it can guide other shelters seeking to develop similar programming and can inspire the broader human service sector seeking to invest in more transformative programs. Between 1993 and 2022, Hennepin County shelter policy included some form of a pay-to-stay provision, requiring shelter guests to forfeit all or most of their income to remain in shelter. Following a growing call to reform this policy, a coalition formed in 2020 between the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs, shelter leaders at People Serving People, Research in Action, Hennepin County leaders, and the Polev Foundation to explore an alternative to the self-pay model. Employing participatory action research strategies, this collaborative engaged current and former shelter guests to develop an innovative financial empowerment program that eliminated pay-to-stay obligations, provided savings opportunities, and administered financial empowerment classes. Between November 2021 in April 2022, People Serving People launched this pilot program, Families for Finance, FFF. Our team Kira served as the evaluation partner examining both program development and program implementation. In 2022, Hennepin County eliminated the self-pay policy, citing in part an earlier Kira report highlighting the impacts of self-pay on individual families facing housing instability. Eliminating self-pay was a victory for families and advocates alike but impacted enrollment and the voluntary pilot as the FFF program was an attractive alternative to self-pay. Despite this challenge and the immense impact of COVID-19, this report shows the innovative impacts of a program developed by and for shelter guests, highlighting the key learnings and recommendations for future community-driven initiatives for the broader field. Between 2007 and 2018, homelessness declined nationally by 15% including 38 states that observed a reduction to the number of people experiencing homelessness. During the same period, however, Minnesota's homeless population grew dramatically. Hennepin County accounts for 40% of the state's homeless population, and over the past decade, the homeless population living outside of formal shelter rose by 93% in the Twin Cities metro area. Prior to this state of emergency, State and local officials sought a number of policy solutions to address the needs of a growing homeless population, including requiring shelter guests to pay a portion of their shelter stay. This self-pay policy evolved over time in Hennepin County. Starting in 1993, the Minnesota Family Homeless Prevention and Assistance Program was established by the Minnesota Legislature to address the growing demands for emergency assistance and shelter. In order to avoid massive turnaways of people experiencing homelessness, a number of strategies were employed, including a pay-to-stay provision, suggesting that all shelter clients with representative payee accounts managed by Hennepin County should be charged for shelter if they have sufficient funds. In 2019, community advocacy resulted in modifications to the shelter payment model. Hennepin County piloted a more sustainable payment system in which families were allowed to keep $70 per person per month until they moved into permanent housing. Finally, in December 2021, the Hennepin County Board voted to completely eliminate self-pay for shelters. The FFEC Collaborative looked outside of Hennepin County to see how other jurisdictions were managing self-pay policies and for inspiration on alternatives. This investigation pointed us to New York and Los Angeles. Shelters that utilize self-pay models suggested that following the 2008 financial crisis and the drastic increase in homeless individuals made current funding structures untenable. Self-pay was introduced as a more sustainable option. 
This comparative assessment of self-pay policies across the country was used by the FFEC Action Committee as they designed the Financial Empowerment Program for Hennepin County. We use a participatory action research approach developed by Research in Action, an action research, community engagement, and racial justice consulting firm to create an alternative financial empowerment model to the self-pay strategies employed in Hennepin County. Key to the PAR approach is researchers and participants working together to develop a shared understanding of the problem and co-creating solutions. In this case, we worked with nine current returning or former people serving people shelter guests to initiate the Family Financial Empowerment Collaborative Action Committee, the FFEC. I feel like I'm making a difference because there's multiple, all of us are being heard in our own way and also we're making a change to others who won't speak up about it. Following these action committee meetings, the Families for Finance FFF program was created. The FFF program aims to empower families living in shelters by not only increasing their financial literacy, but also by centering cultural awareness and trauma-informed care as program pillars. Three major goals inform the design of the FFF program. One, provide protection in a financial emergency and support long-term financial stability. Two, identify the current situation and appropriate financial plan for individuals. And three, provide financial knowledge, skills to confront short-term and long-term financial issues. The Families for Finance program will offer eligible families at People Serving People Financial Empowerment Programming as an alternative to self-pay, meaning that those participating will no longer need to self-pay their income to the county to stay in shelter. Participants will work with JotQuil to create a personalized work plan that includes one-on-one -on -one financial empowerment and coaching conversations, creating a goal plan, progress reports on goals, budgeting plan, financial classes, including uh, financial healing and empowerment session, budgeting and savings, credit and debt, and banking and credit unions. This will also include a savings plan, surveys, and evaluations. For those of you that have previously stayed at People Serving People, you may remember the financial classes through a program called Money on My Mind. Participants in Families for Finance would go through the same sessions. However, we did add a class that we are calling Financial Empowerment. This session was built around the ideas that you all, the Action Committee, brought to our meetings. In this session, we take a dive into what trauma means, the different kinds of trauma, and what finances looked like in our families as we were growing up. We also explore redlining and how our community's history still impacts our communities today and our experiences with finances. Another huge portion of the program is the opportunity to save. Participants will be opening savings accounts at the institution of their choosing if they do not already have one. When they obtain the savings account, they will earn $250 towards that savings account. As part of the savings agreement, families will also set up a monthly goal for themselves to save. The Families for Finance program will match up to $3,000 total per family. So who is eligible? Everyone currently staying at People Serving People is eligible. However, we are prioritizing families based on length of stay and earned income. Income that would be paid directly to the front desk, like employment income, SSI, etc. The program objectives that were co-developed include one, to financially empower families in shelter, two, to improve participants' financial literacy, and three, to facilitate long-term success and stability. Current and former shelter families learned about how to design an evaluation plan during the six FFEC Action Committee meeting. The knowledge acquired from this presentation was put into practice in which committee members had the opportunity to collaborate with Kira to develop the evaluation plan for the FFF program. Four primary data collection methods were selected to evaluate the effectiveness of this program. Document analysis, observations, surveys, and interviews. Between November 2021 and April 2022, 25 participants agreed to participate in the pilot program and corresponding evaluation. Out of these 25 participants, 15 were able to successfully complete all program components. PSP stopped offering the program for research purposes after April 4th, 2021, however continued to enroll participants after that date into the program without the research component.
Prior to COVID-19, our original intent was to have a much larger population enrolled in the pilot. However, as shelter policies evolved and shifted throughout the pilot period, our eligible participant pool became more complicated. In response to recommendations laid out in the 2019 Illusion of Choice report recommending the elimination of the self-pay policy, alongside growing community opposition to the practice, effective January 1, 2022, the Hennepin County Board voted unanimously to eliminate the self-pay policy. This policy change, while a tremendous win for shelter guests and advocates alike, significantly reduced the incentive for participants to engage in the pilot. Because of the small number of participants, we are hesitant to make conclusive statements about the FFF pilot program. Instead, we use this report to highlight observed successes and challenges, areas of participant satisfaction and feedback, and opportunities for further investment. As we mentioned before, we evaluated the FFF program based on appropriateness, effectiveness, and efficiency. We think that through our observations and survey responses, the FFF program demonstrated promise in all three evaluation areas. The evidence we examined suggests that the FFF curriculum provides appropriate information to better understand one's financial trauma and to begin to engage with cultural attitudes towards money. One data point that aligns with this assessment is that 83% of survey respondents suggested that the FFF program help participants identify and begin to heal from their experiences of financial trauma. In terms of effectiveness, almost all participants agreed that the classes offered as part of the FFF program were beneficial and relevant. Participants generally reported that they had learned helpful and new information, and survey responses suggest that participants felt that the FFF classes were effective in building the targeted skill set. Furthermore, participants indicated that the FFF program was successful at reducing financial stress, a key goal of the program and likely a result of both the skills acquired in the classes and the savings match component. In terms of efficiency, participants indicated that they thought the expenditures on the program coordinator were efficient. Not only was she able to build relationships with participants, but she was able to engage them in material by sharing her own experiences. FFF pilot participants also indicated that the program was successful in providing needed services, suggesting an efficient use of the program budget. While there were limited participants in the formal pilot program, we believe these survey results combined with observations suggest that the FFF program is a promising practice worth additional investment and refinement. Engaging current and former shelter guests in the development of the FFF program resulted in particular insights and nuance that we believe contributed to a model that is distinctly responsive to the needs of current and future shelter guests. While many of the components of the FFF program were informed by or adapted from existing programming. In review of the action committee meetings, we observed four unique program elements that participants advocated for, including addressing financial trauma prior to engaging in financial literacy activities, prioritizing partners with lived experience, seeking communal healing and peer accountability, and embedding individualization, choice, and flexibility in the model. A key insight for the development of the FFF program was the realization that individuals must understand how they psychologically associate with money before improving financial literacy. The group began to describe one's relationship to money, a relationship that is established at a young age, often through cultural values and family experiences as financial trauma. We suspect that while financial trauma is an often overlooked aspect, of traditional financial empowerment curriculum, it may be a powerful ingredient, particularly for black and brown communities who have experienced and presently experience systemic financial exclusion and oppression. Throughout the action committee meetings, participants described the importance of ensuring that the individual delivering the financial empowerment program had lived experience, both to support building connections with participants but also to infuse storytelling and real world examples into the curriculum. Program participants discuss the fact that entering shelter can be isolating and traumatizing. One way the action committee identified to address these challenges was to intentionally build connections and support networks through this financial empowerment program. The action committee described 
the value of building accountability by pairing shelter guests with one another in order to attain individualized goals and to facilitate opportunities for communal healing while in shelter. The Action Committee expressed early and often the need for an effective program to adapt and respond to the specific needs of families as they maneuver the crisis of entering shelter. The Family for Finance program in itself is just amazing. Whatever I learned from that class, I take it and I teach it to my children, and I hope that they're listening. I have one that's going to be of legal age in the next few years, and I kind of want to set her up for success if possible. Following our analysis, we developed two categories of recommendations. One set that was particularly tailored to the success and sustainability of the FFF program, and the second, a broader set of recommendations related to community and human service level learnings about developing a community-led program. Based upon the information gathered from participants about their motivations for engaging in the FFF program, we suggest that PSP could modify recruitment materials to align with those stated incentives. Specifically, participants mentioned goals to one, improve financial literacy in order to improve financial stability, two, seeking opportunities to improve financial stability for their children, and three, the opportunity for a savings match. By tailoring recruitment materials to center around the interests articulated by participants, PSP may be able to increase program enrollment. Similarly, there were important insights provided by participants who exited the program early. One recurring rationale was that participants with jobs were unable to participate because of their work schedules, as FFF classes were typically offered during standard working hours. To accommodate work schedules, PSP could consider offering FFF classes outside of standard work hours, evenings or weekends as a strategy for enhanced participation. Additionally, participants mentioned that childcare was a prohibitive factor to engaging with the FFF program. PSP offers childcare support, but families must enroll their children and there can be a wait list. We suggested that there may be a need to embed specific childcare options into the FFF program. Shelter guests mentioned that alternative programming prevented them from engaging with the FFF program. PSP could consider how FFF could work with other programming and or work with residents to determine whether there are opportunities for flexibility to support participation in multiple programs. Finally, participants offered helpful insights for how to improve the specific content shared as part of the FFF program and financial literacy classes. Several participants stated that they wished there was more in-depth programming. In response, we recommend that PSP offer an FFF Part 2 program that goes into greater depth and covers a wider range of topics based on the interests of participants. A few participants mentioned their discomfort discussing sensitive personal topics as part of the program, in particular related to financial trauma. Therefore, we recommend that PSP consider additional supports to mitigate that discomfort. We also recommend supports to manage the math required for the credit and debit class. Several participants mentioned that there is limited support once exiting shelter. Therefore, we recommend that PSP offer, as needed, program elements to individuals who have exited shelter. Due to COVID-19, many of the communal elements of the FFF program were not implemented, including the peer accountability aspect. As the limitations of COVID-19 continue to diminish, we recommend seeking ways to incorporate peer accountability elements and communal aspects into the FFF program. The savings match feature of the program was a significant factor to attracting families to participate in the FFF program. However, asset caps and funding limitations are meaningful obstacles that should be considered for future iterations. While PSP is already mindful of public benefit eligibility parameters, it might be beneficial to incorporate an individualized benefits counseling component into the FFF program. Finally, participants asked for additional housing-related, education-related, and job-related supports. While PSP offers these supports through other programs, we suggest finding ways to integrate those supports or to coordinate with other internal programming so that FFF participants feel supported in these areas. 
Following the completion of the pilot period, PSP has continued to refine and improve upon the FFF program. By offering all program elements in an a la carte manner, they have increased accessibility and utilization of the program. After the pilot, from May 2022 to July 2023, PSP served 97 additional participants, which represents a nearly 300% increase in participation. They have matched over 70,000 additional dollars, which represents a 200% increase from the pilot, and have supported the initiation of 91 additional savings accounts, a 400% increase. We see this as evidence of PSP's resolve to continue refining the FFF program to meet family needs and their commitment to growing the impact and reach of this program. We encourage continued investment in the FFF program and hope to continue to monitor its impact over time. The remaining recommendations were opportunities we observed as translatable to the broader human service sector. In seeking information on self-pay policies and programs to inform the FFF program development, we discovered there was limited scholarly literature on this phenomenon. We see value in further exploring and understanding how self-pay shelter policies are implemented in the U.S. and therefore are writing about self-pay in Hennepin County and in other regions to begin this conversation within the broader scholarly community. Our program design process was informed by the equity in action model developed by Research in Action. The design of the FFF program was driven by impacted families through the FFEC Action Committee. By fostering an environment in which families with lived experience could design and develop a program for families in shelter, we believe the FFF model resonates more closely with the needs of families than it otherwise would have. We encourage other entities seeking to develop effective programming to empower impacted individuals, families, and communities to drive the process. After the completion of the FFF pilot, PSP staff members modified the program to be more accessible to families by offering all program elements in an a la carte manner. We believe programs working with families experiencing hardship should replicate this prioritization of flexibility and continuous effort to eliminate participation barriers. We recommend that other programs seeking to address poverty and eliminate housing instability consider implementing the matching savings program. PSP provided matching savings to families during and after the pilot was completed. The table below represents the impact that this program element has had on families between November 2021 and December 2022. Between November 2021 and December 2022, there were 24 savings accounts opened. There were $10,125 provided in savings startup funds, and there were $41,874 provided in matched funds. The design of the FFF program revealed that traditional financial literacy programs do not address financial trauma, despite its stated importance as a prerequisite to seeking financial empowerment. And there is a gap in the professional sector to lead and train in the field of financial trauma. We recommend that financial trauma be embedded into financial literacy courses, particularly those aimed at communities of color facing systemic economic disempowerment, and the human service sector should also invest in professional development related to financial trauma because its potential role in fostering sustainable economic stability for its clients. A benefits cliff is when an incremental gain in earnings either decreases a public benefit or eliminates eligibility to a public benefit altogether. This can result in a significant net loss to an individual or a family. Offering a savings component within the FFF program can threaten individual or family eligibility to other vital benefits, including childcare, healthcare, or food. In order to eliminate this barrier for families, we recommend that all local counties and social service providers build upon the momentum of the passage of the Minnesota Family Investment Program six-month budgeting periods, medical assistance continuous eligibility for minor enrollees, and housing support income modifications, and seek additional opportunities to mitigate the impact of the benefits cliff. By leveraging an intentional engage action research process using Research in Action's Equity in Action model, the FFEC Action Committee was able to develop a financial empowerment program that uniquely aligns with the needs of families and shelter. A few key tenets of the FF model emerged, in part because of the lived expertise provided by the Action Committee. 
First, opportunities for tangible financial support through a savings and matching program. Second, the need to address financial trauma before engaging in financial literacy activities. And third, opportunities for communal learning and peer accountability. There were a few major challenges that the FFEC faced when seeking to implement the model, including COVID-19, the difficulty finding a qualified external partner with the expertise necessary to administer the program as designed by the Action Committee, and the changes in the Hennepin County self-pay policy. In light of these realities, PSP adapted the scope and some of the elements of the program model, primarily related to the group or communal aspect of the program. Because of these limitations, the scope of the evaluation narrowed. However, based on the observations, survey responses, and interviews gathered from the individuals that were able to participate in the pilot program, there is a clear evidence that the program was appropriate, effective, and efficient. The evaluation also provided some clear strategies for future iterations of the FFF program, including tailored recruitment strategies, strategies to improve accessibility, and specific areas to expand or modify current program content. Developing and implementing a family-driven program also resulted in key lessons learned and targeted recommendations for the provider and the advocacy community seeking to employ innovative and collaborative future initiatives. We would like to acknowledge all the partners and community leaders that made this work possible. Most of all, we want to thank the FFEC Action Committee for their investment, partnership, and vision for the FFF model. This project would not have been possible without their outstanding work. We wanted to say thank you on behalf of Hennepin County for your participation in this family financial empowerment project. You brought an important voice of lived experience to this effort. Your input about how finances intersect with your lives and your shelter experience has made a difference that will impact many families in the future. Your voice has been very instrumental in creating the framework and the program activities for the Families for Finance pilot program. We couldn't have done it without you. We thank you so much for your participation. People serving people would like to thank you, the Action Committee, for helping to make this all possible. Basic understanding of finances and money management is part of the foundation to housing stabilization. It is with your experiences, time, and commitment to this program that we are able to directly center the voices of the families that we serve at People Serving People and are able to offer this program. Thank you for everything.